said that I'm just going to try and present to most of the people in the room who I guess are Julia programmers why they should be interested in atomistic physics and then potentially for physicists sort of watching later on YouTube why you should be interested in Julia. So a lot of this all comes about because of um, sort of the work that was done just before the Second World War. So this is Paul Dirac, it's his birthday today. And this is his representation of the Schrodinger equation. So this is the equation that describes electronic structure. So everything around us is made of electrons. Um, and this is a sort of famous quote from him, 1929, a long, long time ago, recognizing that effectively they had found the equation that describes all of chemistry. So all of chemistry, all of materials. The problem was you couldn't really solve it. Um, so, of course, now we have computers, so we can start to solve these things. And so this, this whole area is called electronic structure theory. And you essentially just tell your computer program a set of atomic locations. You put it into your big, your big supercomputer. And then, potentially, you can predict all material properties with this. Um, the big problem is that the, the, the actual, the correct algorithm that gives you the true solution um, is factorially scaling. So that's obviously a bit of an issue. So just a fleck of dust has about 10 to the 20 electrons in it. And so if you're reusing that to a factorial power, you obviously have something that's not going to complete before the end of the universe. Another, and so you have to make approximations. And a thing that's been the case, this is where, where all the work has gone in like the last 60 years, is as you make better approximations in the theory, you tend to end up with more complexity in the codes. Um, and so why be interested in this? Well, this is Archer. This is the, the supercomputer in the UK. And this is a breakdown of all of its, um, where the time is spent by research area. And so this large area is material science, there is chemistry, and there is biomolecular simulation, which also has atoms jiggling around. And so you've got greater than 70% of the total supercomputer um, time is being spent on moving atoms and molecules around. So it really is the biggest area of research in terms of the actual where the computer time is going. Um, and the reason why, simply, it's sort of the brutal answer is because it's where the grant money is coming from. And the reason that the grant money is available in this area is because it's actually useful, you know, Every time these days you make a new drug or new material or try to understand why something's going on, you will do some of these calculations to actually understand the sort of the underlying process going on at an atomic scale. Okay, and so what codes are these written in? So these labels are too small to read, but here's Python, tiny little dot up here. There's C, C++, and this enormous cluster of different codes is Fortran. So the vast amount of time spent on the supercomputers is Fortran, and it's moving sort of atoms and molecules around. Um, so why is this a problem? Well, not necessarily. I mean, the issue is that you start with these beautiful compact equations that you write down as a physicist, and you end up converting them into these terrifying nested for loops. Um, and you often have sort of um, legacy code bases going back to the 1980s. Um, so you have some beautiful sort of all capitals, Fortran 77 stuff that you have to deal with. Um, and all of the parallelization, so you know, we're desperate to um, get these codes running as fast as possible, is often done just with raw MPI. So as a PhD student, you can basically spend your entire PhD just getting up to speed with a code base and sort of understanding the, the, the software architecture methods you're expected to use. So I think that physics and Julia actually have a very similar representation of the world. So physics is a very reductionist view. And so we have functions, operators, and functionals. And we have a representation of the world. So, you know, our vectors and our quaternions and our tensors all come from physics and our attempt to sort of explain what's going on in the most simple manner. The reason we bother to do all of this is that we believe fundamentally that physics is very transferable. So once you break it down to these universal laws, you then take these universal laws and apply them to lots of different systems. So that's, you know, the, the, the sort of the philosophical view of a physicist. Um, and then if we look at Julia, we find it's actually a very simple language at the base, and there are functions, and there are types, and it's very easy to sort of specialize on these types, make very complicated abstract things, actually represent a lot of our knowledge about the world. And it's very composable. So once you write a bit of code, it's very easy to sort of like fit it into other bits of code quite nicely without having to sort of go back to your terrible, brittle for loops that you wrote once and then try and sort of change them around again. Um, so the challenge in atomistic physics is that we have a lot of theories. There's a lot of very nice work. And there's a lot of work, in fact, that's sort of in these um, physical review papers from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which has never really been implemented or used, simply because it's a lot of effort to actually get these codes going. And we've, we've sort of ended up with two tiers of research, which is never a very um, sort of efficient way to work. So we have people that actually do the method development um, who implement new theories, um, but often on quite simple and contrived systems, and they end up with very brittle codes and not very easy to generalize. And this is getting worse and worse as our method complexity is increasing. Um, alternatively, sort of the more downstream users, the majority, 
they apply well understood theories, but because they've been sort of separated away from the code, you know, they don't actually look at the code that's sort of running their jobs on a day to day. They don't necessarily know what's going on. It's not their fault, it's just that, you know, if you're not actually interacting with what's, what's actually happening because it's too difficult, you don't definitely understand everything. Um, so just very briefly now in these last four minutes, I guess, just sort of talk through some little bits of physics. Um, as a physicist, I have to have a Hamiltonian in every talk that I present, otherwise I'm thrown out of the professional societies. Um, and so this is a tiny little package. I'm not suggesting that everyone should use it unless you have some polar ones you want to calculate for. But it's just an example of sort of the way Julia can accelerate your ability to implement these methods in quite a sort of powerful and transferable way. So this is a representation of a polaron. It's an electron in a material which is interacting with the lattice vibrations. Um, it's quite a cute little problem. It's a very simple quantum field theoretical problem. Um, one appro approach to actually solve it is to use path integration. This results in some fairly simple equations that you need to um, um, specialize on. And so it's slightly cut off the screen, but this is a paper from 1955 with the actual equations in it. They were updated in the 90s, um, sort of a more easy to represent method, but there was just no code out there to actually do these calculations. If there'd been a code, it would have just gone and used it. Um, but in instead, you sort of start with um, a paper like this, this typical physics paper, it has some nice simple equations, and then some fairly sort of throwaway values. Um, this is a variational procedure, so effectively this thing, sort of 62A, you just need to vary, vary the parameters that go into it until you find the lowest energy solution. So it's quite a standard thing that you find yourself doing in, in physics again and again. In this case, you're only varying two parameters, so you could do this with a primitive method, just do a little grid search. And um, the only slightly scary thing about this is that you've got an integral. It's an integral that has to be numeric. And then normally you wouldn't imagine that you could get any gradients or anything, so your optimization would be quite inefficient. Um, and so in Julia, we can just write down all of these equations just directly. And so this is now more for the physicists that you can, can use Unicode in your equations and in your variables, which is actually very useful when you're sort of writing down maths and then looking back up at the screen and looking up and down. Um, you can evaluate something. And then actually the optimization of this is really quite easy. So this is with the Optim package, which is extremely powerful, and the application of automatic differentiation to generalized mathematical functions in physics is an extremely powerful technique. Um, and so it just worked effectively with a bit of sort of messing around. You can sort of reproduce your data, therefore you have success. And the only reason to do this was, of course, um, my material system I was looking at was nowhere near the parameters that had been calculated back in the 90s. Um, and so this is one of my favorite quotes from Numeric Recipes. It's about the golden brick. So it's saying that, you know, even ridiculously overpowered numerical techniques, which seem like sort of squashing a fly with a golden brick, are actually fine if you already have the golden brick. Um, and really, I think um, Julia is something that basically just gives you a lot of golden bricks to play with. Um, and so with this, you can very quickly sort of build up a sort of a rugged and transferable code that calculates a lot of parameters and does sort of a lot of useful physics. Um, and this is just the only results um, figure in this paper. This is the ex these are the experimental data here and here, and these nice continuous curves are the result of, of the Julia program that I was just talking about. Um, so two minutes left, so just very briefly again, this is just sort of another a very similar problem in which there's a nice uh, paper from the 80s and there was no implementation available. Um, and it's just to show that actually relatively sophisticated programming concepts are sometimes useful even to our simple physicists. Um, so this is uh, another quantum mechanical method. It doesn't really matter what's, what's going on in here. Originally, it was apparently done on a Sinclair spectrum. So, you know, you don't really need Julia or a supercomputer to do any of this. It just makes it an awful lot easier. Um, so again, you can just represent exactly what you see in your paper in, in a way that's very, very natural. There's a bit of complexity here, and this is an indefinite integral that needs to be done numerically. Um, I mean, I have some vague concept that involves like rescaling your real number line or something, but I don't really want to get involved in that area of numerical analysis. But very nicely, Julie just, just sort of does it for you in this case with this package. Um, and we're a very happy representation of these infinities. So again, this is very abstract, very useful for when you're just trying to sort of get some results out of this. Um, the result is it optimizes. Oh, that's a zero number. Um, and finally, just macros are very useful because even simple things such as putting in different potentials into our calculations is, is a very natural thing to do. So we want to be able to specialize and then pass functions which are built for particular things. Um, so I guess I'll just stop there and leave you to read this. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jarvis. Other questions? So 
Sorry, me, me again. Um, many years ago, I was a physicist, well, I still am, I suppose. Can we go back to your, your results slide? One, you've got one data point there at one temperature, and then you're saying that it's compatible <coughs> with these curves. How difficult is it to get some more data points on there? Come on. Extremely difficult. Really? Um, okay. So this is why we use computers okay. fundamentally. So the, this is actually experimental data as well, but on a polycrystalline sample, which is why the numbers are lower. So this is right. the, the electron mobility of this thing. And these are the single crystal samples. And yes, I have asked, why didn't they put it in a cryostat? And the answer is, putting it in a cryostat makes your measurement much more difficult. So it's very, very okay. difficult to get that data. Yeah, I, I would like to see one, one or two more, so you could... You could I would love to see <laughs> some more data points. If, <laughs> Just, you, if you go and yeah. argue with these physicists and get them, yeah. shackle them to the cryostats and make them some samples, then please yeah. do, please, please well, do. It's been, it's been a heat wave, you know, we've got up and down to the I'm joking. But no, uh, yeah, yeah okay, okay, I understand. It's, it's, so that, that's why you're obviously doing these studies. Experimental studies, physics it's, it's is really exceptionally difficult, that, that, that. which is why I do computational physics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, time for another quick, quick question. Yes? No? Okay, let's thank the speaker again.